Okay, so uh, welcome. This is lecture five of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're going to be dealing with Jewish sex during the uh, Second Temple period. So be before we start there, uh, Karen Moore sent this to me. This is a uh, fragment scroll of one of the scrolls, and we had talked about the mentioning of God's name, how it was, uh, how they were very uh, particular with it. So uh, Karen writes, if you recall, I had mentioned in one of your talks that it was particularly interesting the way the Jews of Qumran sect considered God's name to be so holy, they wrote it in Paleo-Hebrew instead of Hebrew. No one seems to know what I was talking about, and I just located my book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, so I took a photo to illustrate what I was referring to here. So this is a passage from Psalms 21. So they were uh, particularly careful, and they would write God's uh, name using this Paleo-Hebrew as opposed to... Uh, a more current version of it. So that's one of the interesting finds that has come to light with these Dead Sea Scrolls, which other groups are just writing God's name, probably the way uh, similar to we write it, and they were using an older version of it. So thank you, Karen, for bringing that to our attention. Okay, so now we'll go into uh, the presentation for tonight. Okay, so we're, we're dealing with the, uh, the sex of the Second Temple period here. Our primary source comes from Josephus, the famous Jewish historian. So uh, I know a lot of you at least are somewhat familiar with Josephus. I'll just recap him in a couple minutes here, being that we're, uh, everything we're seeing really is, or almost everything we're seeing is through his lens. So he started out as a Jewish general in the Great Revolt Against Rome, which started in 66 CE. He wound up surrendering to the Romans at Jopeta, which is up in the north with his forces. And I say Masada-like surrender. Uh, you may have heard me tell this story, but it's a good short, very short story. So I'll tell it again, is uh, what had happened is he and his men were captured by the Romans. They were basically entrapped so they enter into the suicide pact and they basically draw lots to decide who's going to kill who and they're uh, killing each other committing suicide and he admits to rigging it so he and this one other guy are the last two and he claims to have received a prophecy from god at that point saying josephus surrender yourself to the romans no point killing yourself might as well chronicle what's going on so it'll be pre preserved for history and people could learn from this disastrous mistake in revolting against rome so he surrenders himself to the Roman general Vespasian. And uh, he actually goes out and tells Vespasian he's going to be the next emperor of Rome. That's not much of a prophetic ability, by the way, if anyone was wondering. Yes, Vespasian does become Rome's next emperor. Uh, but simply put, the Roman emperors at that point were unstable. And uh, Vespasian is simply the strongest leader. So it's just a well-informed, politically educated guess that came to fruition on Josephus's part. So uh, scholars also believe that this was the real Masada, not really Masada. What I mean by that was there's a lot of scholarly debate and scholars now really question Josephus' suicide story, which took place, which he claims took place on Masada. I think more or less the Romans, the Jews fought it out and the Romans killed the Jews. There may have been certain individuals who committed suicide, but what's, what's really believed is that Josephus took his story, suicide story, and transposed it onto Masada, and I will get to that very shortly why he would do that. But as I said, he uh, travels around with the Romans, chronicling the great revolt against Rome. He settles in Rome under Flavian patronage. That's, that's the uh, name that goes along with Vespasian. Sometimes people call him Flavius Josephus, so Josephus Flavius. He takes that name because he's writing under Flavian patronage. And uh, scholars suspect perhaps that he didn't want to write that a big Roman garrison basically massacred a small group of Jews that were trying to fight. This way it makes, takes the Romans off the hook for looking unduly harsh. And also he puts this heroic speech in the mouth of Eleazar ben Ir, the commander of the uh, Jewish forces as well. So everyone looks good, but historians strongly suspect uh, based on uh, the tactics the Romans would have, have employed, they don't match up with what Josephus uh, explains at all. So he writes in Greek about Jewish history and religion for a Greco-Roman audience. So what he's really doing is he's explaining Judaism to the non-Jewish world. 
Okay, and now he's going to go about and present for he's talking about three main sects and then there are smaller ones or subdivisions as well. But during the Hasmonean era, we're talking about probably about 140 or so of the common era, maybe 150 of the common era BCE. Uh, this is uh, 20, 25 years after the Hanukkah story. Uh, we have sex really start to pop up and become prominent. And it's not really surprising. Think about American history. Washington uh, rails against factionalism. But yet we have the, the, uh, the Federalists and the, the Democratic Republicans, and then they morph into other parties. But uh, this is not really that surprising in light of the fact that uh, this happens all the time. So the three main schools are the famous ones, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. And then a fourth one emerges in the lead up to the revolt against Rome, we have the zealots or sacari, which means dagger men. And these are, these are the figures that actually take Masada in the uh, 50s of the common era or so and use it as a fortress until it falls in 73. So uh, we have different terms for them and there's a reason for this. I caught this in a uh, Schiffman once, uh, Professor Schiffman once on TV explaining this that the, uh, Josephus uh, uses the term Sakari because he's writing, his, his whole perspective in talking about this revolt is to really paint the Jews as incapable of governing themselves, they're too busy engaging in civil war, and therefore they need the Romans to come in as the adults and really rule them and bring law and order because he's writing at the behest of the Romans at this point. So if you call them zealots, kinuim uh, uh, in Hebrew, that really has a, uh, that could have a very positive overtone, religiously passionate people. Think about Pinchas from the Torah. The rabbis are uncomfortable with his actions uh, because it could lead to vigilanteism. But on the other hand, God is very impressed. And certainly when you say someone is a zealot, it could be negative, but it certainly can be taken positively. Sakari uh, dagger men, people that would walk around with knives under their robes, stabbing Jews who collaborated with Ro Romans or, or Roman officials, that already, they sound like assassins, has a much more negative type of uh, connotation. So that's the term he uses. Okay, so there's no mention in Josephus of Christianity per se, though he does mention a figure, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, oh, actually, so uh, I skipped uh, here. Okay, so he mentions Jesus, but historians are pretty sure that the, mentions of, the mentioning of Jesus is doctored by later Christian scribes. So we're not really sure. It seems to be Joseph probably may have been aware of him, uh, but we're really not sure what he was saying, or it's possible that it could have been added in later. We're not quite sure what's going on there. Uh, Rabbi, could I add something right here? Yes. Um, <clears throat> at this time, there was nothing called Christianity. Christianity doesn't appear in the literature until a, a quite a bit later. Jesus was not considered at that point a Christian or a starter of any new religion. So I think one of the things that really becomes very confusing to people uh, is, is, is in that little piece of, uh, of history uh, Christianity is not mentioned in the Bible, and it doesn't exist until maybe 200 uh, in the in the Common Era. So that should, okay. I just wanted to clarify that, uh, just because we don't ex we don't expect to see Christianity in the story of Jesus at all, because it doesn't exist. Okay, that's a good point, and it's also in general that, and I was going to make a similar point, uh, I think, in the next slide actually. But since you brought it up, it's a good time to bring it up. That when we when we think about when did Christianity appear, in in uh, hindsight we tend to want to fix certain dates and say Christianity started on such and such date, and of course that's not the way these movements really start. So uh, as Susan is alluding to, you have a figure named Jesus who has who has a following, and then over a long historical period, uh, Jesus really is transformed from uh, from from a, a prophetic type of figure, even within Christian literature. And it's really, a, a, correct me if I'm wrong, Susan, but it's really in the Council of Nicaea that ultimately the, the, the uh, status of Jesus is really defined, which is in 325 CE. So right, well, really... yeah. Go Sorry. ahead, Susan. Well, I, I, I think that there's probably a half an hour's discussion here somewhere. 
But, uh, and I think it's interesting that you bring that up uh, because it's a, whole, it's a whole thing that happens within a period of like 250 years of the, of the church fathers who start promoting uh, Jesus in this special kind of way um, and uh, start ascribing to him uh, attributes that weren't ascribed to him while he lived. So the idea that um, he, he probably had this special uh, kind of description uh, of him by the time uh, Constantine comes along, uh, but it's really the church fathers pre-Constantine uh, that really start the whole negative narrative of uh, the anti-Jewish narrative that didn't exist during the period of Jesus and Paul. So we don't see the negative Jewish narrative until about uh, 300 and something uh, of the Christian era. Uh, and the issue of Christianity per se didn't really exist until probably around then. Well, 325 is Constantine. And uh, certainly Constantine fixed a lot of this in, uh, in, uh, in stone, so to speak. Uh, but it certainly existed before Constantine, probably all the way back to probably 180 is when okay. you start seeing these narratives that appear that want to set up Jesus in some kind of new religion. But that's, right. that's, that's a later, it, it is a later narrative. Okay. So, yeah, and even like Professor Schiffman points out, if you look at the Gospels uh, historically, uh, Mark being the earliest, John being the latest, you see changes in the way Jesus is viewed and the relationship to the Jews. If you read carefully, you pick up, you see the beginnings of evolving. And the, the general points I think Susan is making is that these things really develop over a long span of time uh, and slowly. And when, jo I mean, the, for the point of our discussion, when Josephus is writing here, the idea of being quote unquote, uh, Christian as a, a separate religion really isn't on, or even being a Christian, shall we say, isn't necessarily on the radar screen. That's that's really using a later term. Is that correct, Susan? Hello? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, that's, that's essentially true. I mean, what okay. you're saying is essentially true. Okay, okay. terrific. So, um, and I did want to point out we have these three we have these three uh, major Jew we have these three major D Jewish sects the Pharisees Sadducees and Essenes, but the average person was an Am Haaretz, which means a person of the land, like a regular guy. Now nowadays, when you use that term in Jewish circles, it has a negative connotation. Uh, a person of the land, a, a commoner, an, ign an ignoramus, really is a good translation for it. We're not using it in this way here. It just simply means somebody who was a regular guy who wasn't particularly involved in these theological, in these groups which had uh, theological agendas here. Okay, so let's look now at the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the Kohanim, uh, the high priestly circles. They were supported by the aristocracy and the nobility of Judah. So think about today you have people who are in power supported by fat cats. So we have a similar situation. We have a similar situation. They were basically in control of the temple, which was the center of religious worship. They focused on the religion of the Torah per se. This is the Torah, Shabbat the written Torah, as opposed to the oral law, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Basically, the primary mode of worship was sacrifices as laid out in the written Torah. Uh, and they were really, this was the way to worship. They weren't interested in the synagogues, which were emerging during that era. And by the way, you have synagogues emerging as early as uh, 300 of the common era in places like Alexandria, Greece. And uh, the first sightings that historians have noticed are about uh, during the uh, basically beginning of the first century common era in, in Eretz Yisrael. Doesn't mean they didn't exist, but that's the earliest they can be dated. And as I've said, they really, it's not like today we, you know what you're getting more or less when you go to a shul. Uh, some of them were study houses. Some of them were really meeting places where you might talk about religious political issues. Some of them were places where davening was going on. It's not surprising the Sadducees had no interest in them because they represent the competition to the, uh, to the temple. Just as, in, just as if you look at, let's say, in the Book of Kings, it doesn't like when people have their uh, backyard altars, part, partly because they seem to uh, 
pave the way for syncretic type of worship where people start stop i mean start worshiping other gods as well baal and that type of thing but partly because it's simply uh you're taking away the power it's it's competition they denied the concept of angels immortality of the soul or resurrection of the dead and not really surprising when you stop and think about it these people tended to be the more powerful well-to-do people so they're not sitting around saying well life is unfair and why doesn't god treat me better maybe he'll make it up to me in the next world this is later on when judaism starts to deal more and more and just as just as by the way the uh, christianity the idea of christianity developed over a long time period of time same could be said of uh the idea of life after death in judaism there is a very long continuum of uh, early ideas, and it becomes much defined over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years. So they are, they, but they, they don't really have much need to think about this. They reject the uh, Torah Shabal Pevi oral law, which again, I'll explain in a minute a little bit more. And they believe solely in free will, not in fate. And again, basically, if you're doing well in life, oh, of course everything is uh, free will you should be able to do whatever you want and if i'm doing well it's because i have free will and i've made all the right choices rabbi so, uh, yes i have a question karen um did they actually deny angels and immortality of the soul and resurrection or was it just that angelology and those other concepts weren't well developed at that point in time no, they seem to actually they seem to actually deny him. I mean, there seemed to be some, as we say, machloket controversy between the different groups, and there were different points. There were different points of view, and they re denied, rejected whatever word you want to use. What because what we're going to see here when we look at the uh, other two main groups is these type of ideas really are developing and being embraced to different degrees by the other two groups. So you have an argument, and this is a rejection saying we do not accept. We do not accept it. Good question. Does that does that answer, Karen? Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, Rabbi, I have a question. Marty, uh, the Torah actually talks about angels, and angels. You know, they visited Abraham, and they visited jo uh, Jacob. So, but the 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 uh, Sadducees were temple priests, and they read the Torah. So, how can they reject angels? Well, that's a good question. Is you're throwing you're throwing uh, throwing it back at them if you're going to say you're going to be, in uh, in a sense, maybe we could almost say literalists, similar to the Karaites. I'm not saying it's a, it was the, exactly the same as the Karaites, but the, g the same general idea. Well, how could you deny angels? So it seems to be they viewed angels as a figure of speech, basically. So when God is presenting Himself in different ways, uh, and it's just saying a. Uh, uh, Malach would be a servant of Hashem. Like, let's say the angels of Abraham uh, that come to Abraham. Now, you could read that text and 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 actually argue they were simply men who were gods who, who had a message from God. Maybe maybe prophets. In other places, angels seem to be seem to be more uh, other figures. There's always been a concern, or at least in the biblical period, there was a concern about angels being competing with God for power. Think about uh, think about dualism and the devil competing with God, that type of that type of thing. And actually, we, we will see that not in Vic's le lecture, but later on, the Qumran sect did dabble in this dualism type of idea. It's so, a strange. Sorry, it's a strange thing, if I may, to care about. I mean, some of the things you said about the Sadducees, uh, I see why they would care about that and free will because we're doing well. That's because we're. But why would you even make a statement about angels? How did it help or not help them in their struggles with the Pharisees in the essence? Yeah, that I don't know. I mean, the the others you could the others you could make an educated guess, sociologically speaking, why they would take certain positions. Why this one was uh, an issue for them is a good question. I do not I do not know that. Uh, so was, during the biblical period, angels were always unnamed. The idea was they should never. Uh, had their own identity, they simply do God's will. It's during this time period now where angels are gonna take on uh, more character and personality. Gabriel, these type of, uh, Raphael, God's healing, that are going to take on uh, more significance because, because monotheism is, has been firmly established. In the first temple period, we always have this issue of idolatry coming up. Simple, second temple period, 
we no longer have idolatry as a problem. The Talmud says that God took the taiva, the desire to, uh, to wash their idols away after the uh, exile into Babylon. So we really don't have that as a problem. So now angels take on personalities. And for some reason, the, this seems to bother the Sadducees. So it's a good question, John. Rabbi? Alan. Uh, on this point, um, how would they have dealt with Satan? Well, they would they would have denied uh, they would have denied Satan being uh, God's angel, his prosecuting his prosecuting angel. Now, Satan all it really means all it really means is in Hebrew is an adversary. But certainly, if you look at Eov, Job, right, the book of the book of Job, we have Satan is is functioning as as uh, as God's uh, servant and kind of uh, not not fighting with God, but but uh, having a dialogue with God and shaping shaping the narrative. Interesting, just a little something to throw around at your next uh, socially distanced cocktail party or a Zoom session, whatever it is. <laughs> Satan is Satan is a uh, originally a Persian word, and uh, the Satan would be the king's spy who would go hang out in the bars. And find out who is plotting against the king, and then report back to the king. Even you see this in Megillah at Esther, where uh, where we find the two guys plotting against the king. Mordechai turns him in for plotting against the king, and it's critical to the whole uh, narrative in Megillah at Esther. Rabbi Scott, and also with the Sadducees going about what you're saying about the the, the, the Sadducees tended to be more, you know, I, I, I hate to use the word materialistic, but their views were more about nationalism and, and you know, self-effort. I mean, if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, that has a lot of Sadducean mm -hmm. ideas where, you know, all is vanity and there's no afterlife. You know, you work now, you do things now. And the book of Esther, I mean, even, you know, that's coming up, even that, I mean, what's important, the preservation of the Jewish people. I mean, the fact that a Jewish woman would be a consort to a, a Gentile I mean, that, that, that would, you'll never find the Book of Esther among the Essenes, because that was terrible. But among the Sadducees, you know, preserving our nationality, you know, here was a hero, even, you know, to do something that would be considered sinful, but yet it preserved the Jewish people. That's, that's what's important. The Sadducees oh, a, had that kind of view. Well, that's a, that's a good point. I, I mean, McGill and Esther in large degree is, a guidebook and via a story about uh, the things one must do to survive in exile. Uh, uh, not just the example you mentioned, but just the, the whole story in, in general talks about the Jewish, the Jewish circumstance in exile, the Jewish situation in exile. So, I mean, maybe in answer to Jonathan's question, we could maybe guess that um, angels were just the idea was just sort of too out there, out, out there, or ephemeral. I don't, that's not really the right word, but it was too amorphous for the Sadducees. They were more uh, into this world and they just, when they heard the term angel, they, they didn't think of some celestial being, maybe at most uh, a, a corporeal uh, a messenger of God, but not a celestial being. So Rabbi, uh, Karen. If they drew the line at the written Torah <laughs> and they didn't even accept the oral Torah, all of the angels, and the demonology, that was later on. That was in oral Torah and really in books that weren't even part of the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. So it stands to reason that they wouldn't have accepted that. Right, right. Well, that in the sense that the, the, the term angel would have been this very bland figure, just Malach Hashem or Malach, just to, it, but, but, um, but it wasn't an angel in the sense as I mean, it's possible. It's possible when it says they don't accept angels. It may not be they're arguing with God sent a Malach, a messenger as an angel, and maybe even it wasn't human, but they, they, they deny the fact that these angels have personalities or names other than that. I mean, the Talmud talks about, the Talmud talks about, for instance, God was angry at Shlomo, Solomon, uh, for his activities. So he sent, I believe it was Gabriel to smote the Mediterranean Sea with his staff. And out of that shot up all this uh, suit from the uh, sea, which formed the uh, hills of Rome. And eventually, of course, Rome destroys not Shlomo's temple, but the second temple later on. 
So it's possible they're really rejecting this idea of an angel of the personalities because they're not into these rabbinic texts, which are at least orally are starting are starting really to form during this time period. Point, Karen. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the Pharisees now. It's called the Parushim, which means separatists here. So if you're a separatist, you have to be separating from something. You're not, not or else you're not much of a separatist. Let's think about later on the Mitnagdim or the Miznagdim, as people say. They had to be in opposition to someone. They were in opposition to the Hasidim. So who are these Parushim in opposition to? Well, if you remember, we spoke about, uh, well, I don't remember if it was last week or two weeks ago, uh, but Alexander Janaeus or uh, Yonatan Yanni, he's called. He's one of these Hasmonean kings. And he has, uh, Scott actually explained this in one of his lectures. He was a Sadducee and performed the, at the Simchat Beit Shoev at a water drawing festival, which would occur over Halamoit Sukkot, which according to the Talmud was really a great party. Talmud says, if you've never uh, been to this party, you will know what having a good time is. But he performs this water drawing festival using the Sadducean ritual and the Pharisees uh, pelt him with their etrogim and he massacres, he massacres a whole bunch of them. So they're basically form as an, they seem to be forming as an opposition party to the, uh, to the Sadducees. And I think it's fair to say they're really in a sense a popularist movement and they're really continuing Ezra's reforms. If you remember, we, we did speak about last week during the second, early second temple period, Ezra, despite being a Kohen, really imp starts empowering the laity at the expense of the Kohanim by, uh, by teaching, by, by reading the Torah publicly and teaching people how to basically uh, study Torah and hear God's, or hear God's voice through Torah study. It's really Talmud Torah he's doing, teaching them how to study Torah and this gives you another religious option, a path to God, as opposed to simply bringing sacrifices here. So what the, what, the, what the Pharisees are basically doing is they're going to say a lot of what's going on in the temple, we could also do at home too, and we could be holy that way as well. And if, uh, it had actually the broadest popular support. And they developed customs or laws, customs, whatever you want to call them, that weren't even in, in the written Torah itself. When I say that, I mean the, uh, the five books of Moshe, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish, uh, greater Jewish biblical canon does not, had not even been completed at this point. The earliest possible dating is 90 uh, common era and the, Essene, and the Dead Sea sect is wiped out in 68 of the common era. So they developed Purim, which is coming up, which is a biblical holiday. Uh, think about, uh, Think about Natilat Yadayim before eating bread at home when you wash your hands. This is based on before the Kohani would officiate, they would do all of these uh, hand washings and ablutions to make sure they were spiritually prayer. So basically what the Pharisees are saying is you can make your temple into a little home and your table could be a mini altar as well. And you can see why this really related to uh, more of the average type of person. So suddenly you could uh, take all this holiness and do it at home as well. So they weren't two angels and immort immortality, uh, immortality of the soul, which later on, as we already hinted at, evolves into the idea of resurrection of the dead. Okay, they were proponents of a Torah Shabal Pev. This is the oral Torah. Uh, and this is uh, given at Sinai. So it's, it's interesting to note there are two conflicting rabbinical views of what exactly the Torah Shabal Peh is. It, it doesn't really change its authority, but one view is of the Gaonim. You remember if, from last history class, if you attended, the Gaonim were the people like Saja Gaon, that period in uh, places like Babylon, who really, uh, who really were the next generation after the close of the Talmud. And they really viewed this oral law as teachings given directly at Sinai along with the Torah, just not written down. God gave him to Moshe. So we have in our Parsha, eye and tachet eye, an eye for an eye. So of course, that doesn't mean you poke out my eye. If I poke at yours, it means monetary, con uh, monetary compensation is the way it's understood. So they, they'll say, God taught that to Moshe at Sinai. My modern, he says, not quite. What it means is God taught Moshe how to study the Torah and, uh, and find out the principles behind the text. 
similar to the way later on Ezra is teaching people how to study the text and, and figure out what's really going on here, having this uh, relationship of God. So, it, it, but it, regardless, at the end of the day, either way, it's considered, whether you follow the Ka'onim or Rambam, is considered an authoritative text. And we view the Torah, at least legally in the way we behave, Jewish law, is through the eyes of the Talmud. Again, no, no one's saying if uh, someone pokes out your eye, you're going to poke out their eye. They're going to say Jewish law requires that you be properly compensated for it. Okay, so, um, and they believed in a mixture of fate and free will. We have a statement in Perakei Avot, everything is foreseen, yet there is Bechira, free will. So I think what they're saying here, and this is my own take, is that there's fate in the sense that you're born into a certain family, uh, you have certain parents who have characteristic traits, so you're born into a certain, certain economic class, and that will certainly affect a good deal of your life. I mean, you yourself are born with, your, with traits, personality traits, and that certainly is going to affect you. On the other hand, within that, within that situation, you have the free will to make the best of it. So I think that's what they mean by that's what by, they mean by that. They're not arguing that uh, they're not arguing in any sort of predestination. Okay, and Christian, uh, the Christian Bible uh, and Christianity as it later develops tends to view the Pharisees negatively, overly overly legalistic, uh, and self and self righteous, too caught up in in these hair splitting debates and minutia type of things. And by later um, on, that's a, Susan. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little something to that in which uh, um, anybody who in this group who might have read the New Testament or at least the gospel part uh, in which um, Jesus is found to constantly be arguing with the Pharisees over this thing and that thing and his accusation to them was that they add too many of man-made laws onto the people instead of observing God's law. They're really uh, they're really more observant of their own man-made laws. And his perception of that was that um, that was the way in which they uh, amassed and held held on to the power they had over people, which was to burden them with laws that weren't in Torah but were, were ones that they made up. And that was his major argument with the Pharisees, which I thought was really interesting. And I, I'm kind of spending some time there now to see because uh, I'm really interested in the Pharisees. I think they, they contribute a lot to our knowledge, uh, but that was uh, Jesus's main argument with them. Right, so and historians point out what, what's really going on here is, is this argument over what is the best way really to serve God, to have a relationship with God. So I believe, uh, I believe Jesus's criticism of the Sadducees is they're too caught up in, in the sacrifice and the temple ritual. The Pharisees, you just explained what his complaint was. So you have these different groups during this, during this time period laying out different, different paths to God, and they're clearly at times disagreeing with each other. All right, thank you, Susan. Let's move on to the Essenes, which we believe the Qumran was a group was a, an Essene group. So these are the most uh, separatist type of group, even those uh, Perushim, Pharisees mean separatists. The, the Essenes tended to be uh, live more uh, in isolated type of communities, some more than others. It's believed the Qumran sect was uh, probably an extreme case of this. They really cut themselves off. But they're not really, they're less involved in the, the give and take. You wouldn't see them on, like today you see people on these news shows, uh, the liberal is arguing with the uh, conservative and vice versa. So you may have had, a, on, the, on the, the ancient version, you may have had a Sadducee and Pharisee arguing with each other. And the Essene attitude was, I'm not wasting my time going on this talk show having this debate. I'm just going to do my own thing. So as we already saw a couple of weeks ago, they were very into these initiation rituals. They, Josephus views them as they were the, the strictest as far as observance. They were, uh, their observance was uh, the most intensive out of all three groups. They believed in immortality of the soul and angels as well. They denied free will and said all is preordained and predetermined. 
So we see that the, uh, fa the Pharisees have the middle ground, the Sadducees are all free will, the Essenes are on the other side of the spectrum, basically saying God has preordained all and determined what's going to happen. And uh, some were celibate, including they think probably the Qumran or most of the, uh, the Qumran sect was. Uh, Pliny the Elder is me uh, mentions a celibate group of Essenes living near the Dead Sea around 60 of the Common Era. This is most likely a reference to the Qumran sect a little before the Romans destroyed them in 68. Uh, and as I said, it's likely the uh, Qumran sect was, uh, I put this is my own term, hardcore Essenes in the sense they, they really went out of the way to cut themselves, cut themselves off. Okay, let's just, before we wrap up, let's just briefly look at some of the uh, smaller, smaller type of groups. We had Jewish Christians, which are starting to form as Suicides, so they're not really Christians the way we would view it. These are Jews, basic, basically think about the Jerusalem church uh, with James. They basically are keeping Jewish law, but believe in, uh, believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And then you have, and then you have over this time period, of course, Paul is uh, proselytizing. He's going to places in Asia Minor, Syria, all these type of places, and he is very successful, of course, in bringing non-Jews into uh, into his belief system. And eventually, over time, this becomes Christianity. We have the Ebonites are mentioned by the early church fathers. Uh, they were they seem to be Jews or uh, quote unquote Jewish Christians who accept this Jesus. Uh, as the Messiah, but not as God. And uh, that was, as, as uh, we already touched on, this is, and I, I have it in the next bullet actually, around 90 of the common era, the gospel of John, the last historically speaking, at least it seems to be, Jesus seems to start to really be elevated uh, more, uh, more on a plateau with, with God himself. And uh, the Council of Nicaea deals with that uh, much later on in 325. We had the Bethusians who are mentioned in the Talmud, but we just don't really know much about them, quite honestly. We had the Samaritans who are an offshoot of Jews. I'll just explain very quickly in a couple sentences how uh, they came about. So we go back into the first temple period during the divided monarchical era. And we have the 10 tribes are deported by the Assyrians after they revolt against the Assyrians. They get, paid of get pay tired of paying them tribute and try to uh, make a run for independence, and they fail and are deported. So the Assyrians, who are very uh, brutal, they played hardball. What they did is they wanted to make sure this didn't happen again. So they deported people, the 10 tribes, and imported other conquered people. This was a way of breaking up your national uh, identities so you wouldn't revolt again. So some of these people who were imported into the uh, northern area of, of Israel uh, over time, uh, they're, they're having, uh, they're attacked by lions is a story in the Book of Kings. And they say, well, maybe the God of this land is angry at us for not worshiping him. And they, they, they start learning about Judaism and pick up some Jewish practices, but they also maintain their other practices as well from where they, they came from, other religious practices. So when the Jews during the time period of Ezra and Nehemiah, that general time period, during the early Second Temple period, come back, the Samaritans say, hey, we're Jewish. Let us uh, help uh, to rebuild this temple. And the Jewish leadership says, well, you have some Jewish practices, but you're not Jewish, sorry. And they were annoyed. They complained to the uh, Persians about this. Uh, and there was, uh, there was conflict. Uh, as Professor A.J. Levine from Vanderbilt points out that when you call someone a good Samaritan, that originally was meant to be a very ironic term because the Jews did not like the Samaritans and vice versa. So it was, it's like someone going up to you and saying, the good terrorist. No, by definition, a terrorist is not good. So the idea was it was supposed to be a shocking term. And uh, the Samaritans are still around in a very small number today. Uh, and they would argue over issues like, is Jerusalem the correct cultic place, place of worship that is, or uh, Har Grizim, Mount Grizim, which is above Shrem, not all that far from Jerusalem. If you remember when they, in uh, say for Yehoshua, Joshua, when they first crossed into the land, the, uh, they uh, re, re, uh, reseal the covenant with God of the next generation by having a ceremony, ceremony on Mount Abel and Mount Grizim. So this is their cultic center. Uh, they rejected the Davidic kingship. 
and uh, and uh, what 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 to put it in terms of the scrolls. Now uh, we already understood even before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found that Jewish practices varied a fair amount, but the scrolls, which the scrolls really show to a much greater degree how much uh, variance there was in Jewish practice and disagreement between the two different sects, or three different set, main sects and other groups. So now some scholars will talk about it, the Judaisms of the period because the differences were so, were so great. So we'll open it up to Q&A. Next lecture will be, we'll look at the Qumran site itself, which will tell us a lot about our uh, Dead Sea sect. Let me uh, exit out of this here. Okay, questions and answers, fire away. Well, I have to speak up for Josephus. I, I was responding to your comment about 20 minutes ago that Josephus was trying to make the claim that the, the, the Jews couldn't really rule themselves. Um, yeah. So the Romans had to come in and they do look pretty chaotic, although maybe not more than, I don't know, people in Syria or wherever. But I mean, that's what? no different than what the Hasmonean, the, the, the Hasmonean grandsons did. They invited Rome in to referee between their competing kingships. Yeah, I, I, lo so I, I having... lost, you said something about Josephus and then refereeing uh, among Romans to referee. I missed everything in between. Oh, uh, well, sorry. You, you, you sort of say, well, Josephus kind of, not prejudiced, but he was he was angling to, to say it was a good thing Rome came in because they were needed to referee amongst all the Jewish sects. And you certainly Correct. described a lot of Jewish sects and S-E-C-T-S, obviously. Um, and it, it was pretty disorganized. And that was no, I mean, the Hasmonean grandchildren, as you pointed out, invited Rome in the referee between their competing claims on kingship 40 years before all this takes place. So inviting Rome in was a pretty, only a lot of people, you know, that's the advantage of having a big power. They they run, they make the buses run on time for yeah, better okay. or for worse. Yeah. Oh, I'll, did you want to respond, Scott? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say again, I mean, again, we keep lumping the Hasmoneans as they're like a, a homogenous group. I mean, the, the, the great grandsons of, of the original Hasmoneans, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus were brothers. And Aristobulus was definitely nationalistic. He didn't ask the Romans to come in. He wanted to maintain independence. It was his brother, Hyrcanus II, who was weak. And he got manipulated by Antipater, who was a Roman, and it was Herod's father who manipulated himself in there to get his son put in as king of, of Judea. So it, it, what the Hasmoneans, we, we can't lump them as a group. I mean, there were different Hasmonean descendants who didn't feel they needed Roman uh, interference. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say they, you know, and, and keep in mind when Josephus writes, he's trying to preserve his life. So he's always going to make Rome look good. And he does change his opinion. For example, he writes in the war, Bellicum Judaicum, you know, the war of the Jews, which is his first work. He writes that the Hanania, Ananias, was a great high priest. He was a hero. But then when he gets to the antiquities 20 or 30 years later, where Josephus probably realized he's going to meet his maker and he has to be truthful. He, he says just the opposite about Hanania. He says that he was evil. He was wicked, a wicked priest, maybe. So Josephus, you, you have to be very careful in looking at what Josephus says, even about these groups. He was saying whatever he needed to preserve, preserve, you know, his life and try to document what the Jews, the Jewish history was because he was kind of, you know, he's proud of his Jewish background. And he said he was related to the Hasmoneans. He believed he has Hasmonean, Hasmonean blood in him. But he also had to preserve his life and do what the Romans wanted. So you always have to be very careful about following everything he says. But yes, I have a question for Scott or a thought. Uh, it, my understanding is that uh, Josephus was actually in the employ as a historian of the Romans. And so he was writing from a pro-Roman point of view, as you say, to preserve his, I guess his life, I don't know, or his position or whatever. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of things that, um, a lot of things that uh, uh, Josephus says you have to take with a grain of salt. 
So, so, <laughs> so let me just. So these, these are all good. These are all good points. So just, let me respond to them like step by step here. So when we talk about uh, Aristobulus or Stabulus and and Hercules too, appealing appealing to the Romans, while well, it's easy, and I've kind of sometimes said, well, these guys, bright idea, right? It's not as simple as they wanted to necessarily get the Romans involved and not get them involved. Remember, these are politicians, and they see that clearly they're weak. Uh, Pompey is the strong man in the region, so these are all sorts of political calculations. Now, Scott is clearly right that uh, Aristobulus or Aristobulus is the more the stronger, more nationalistic one, and the Romans preferred Hyrcanus because that he they he was a puppet. They, they saw they could use him as a puppet. But regardless of what, I, I, I don't mean when he's writing from a Roman perspective, I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm just viewing that as I'm stating the reality of the situation. Clearly, he's writing under the patronage of the Flavian dynasty. So uh, we, should just be, we should just be aware of that. Now, we should know, note that despite this, in Rome, he's always, he, he continues to live a Jewish life and seems to be a proud Jew. So, but uh, as, as Scott is saying, he's probably, I think it's pretty clear, he, he, he has to keep the people who are paying his bills happy as well. So we, we, should, we should understand all these things. Uh, very clearly, he does, he does have that perspective. Now, he, he does also make another change where initially when he's talking about the Essenes, he, we said it, the most uh, strict, he, he's, he's raving about them. He's really impressed with their piety. After these scenes are wiped out, the Sadducees are gone, and all that's left is the Pharisees. His later accounting of the Pharisees is much more positive than his initial ones, simply because they're the only game in town at this point. It's like, let's say you went to one type of shul, and you were critical of another movement, and then your shul shut down, and the only shul left in town was the other movement shul who you've been critical of you might decide to tone down your rhetoric and uh, just go to the other shul simply because if you want to go to any shul, that's the only game in town. That's probably what was happening there. Rab Rabbi. Good um, points, everyone. I, any other final? Er yeah, Eric. it's Eric. I think it's important to understand that even at this time, there were um, Jewish uh, uh, Jews living in Rome and Italy. If you go to uh, Italy and go to a place called Ostia, which was a town along a port. There is a, there's a synagogue there that uh, was very active apparently at this time. Apparently Jews were merchants and uh, there were a number of warehouses storing grain for Rome. So, and what's interesting is although Rome is obviously being very aggressive uh, in Judea and destroying the uh, second temple at the same time, there's a Jewish community that they're leaving alone in Italy, very close to Rome. I just thought that was interesting. If you go there now, you can see the ruins of this uh, synagogue. Yeah, and th th that's a good point. The, the, first of all, there is a Jewish diaspora, even though we're coming off the heels of a second Jewish independent state, which collapses with Pompey's, in uh, Pompey's invasion in 63 uh, BCE. That, that's, a, that's a good point. And uh, the Romans aren't interested in stamping out Judaism. They don't like people revolting against their authority. They were very happy. If the Jews hadn't revolted, they could really care less what the Jews did. They, in fact, they were very tolerant in that sense. <laughs> they, said, they said, you don't want to worship, uh, worship our gods. Well, you're an old religion. We'll kind of grandfather you in. You do what you want. It was the uh, nationalistic part of it, the messianic fever during uh, this period, and even more so the Bar Kokhba one, which really uh, gets the Jews in trouble because it's a, it's a religious national. Right, and that, and that so thank, thank you. Oh, there, 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 just, there's Aida. Aida, happy birthday from yesterday. Thank you. You're welcome. You're I had welcome. a conflict, was someone that's else? why I just came in. Uh, I, was, I was practicing my happy birthday rendition for you last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, did someone else want to say something before we went into Amara? Uh, what I heard. Yeah, someone, Rabbi, uh, just Scott. Yeah. A follow up with what Eric says. That's important about the diaspora because you that's going to be an important point because Jews were so spread out over the Roman Empire. Anything that happened in Judea, because Jews were very devoted to the temple. And anything, if anything happened in Jerusalem or Judea, they would be very responsive. And Rome knew that. 
And they had to be very careful. If there was going to be any kind of rebellion in Judea, they're going to have to quell it quick because they don't want it spreading around the empire because there was a lot of Jewish, you know, compatriots out there or patriots out there that would join in. And they were well aware of that. So, and, and that also will become important for the, the zealots looking to re recruit because if they're running out of numbers, they know they're going to go up against Rome. Where are they going to recruit these other Jewish communities? These are important. So that having Jews in the diaspora, also Rome had to keep an eye on that, especially because of the strategic location of Judea right near the Parthians, their enemies. Another reason they had to keep an eye on Judea, um, they, they couldn't let anything spread beyond that region. So it's a, what Eric mentioned is very important. It's important. Uh, the Levant was always uh, a crucial land bridge. It was crucial for the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, and now the Romans as well. Okay, so thank you, everyone.